What's up everybody? My name is Greg. Welcome to my Reloading 101, Intro to Reloading, whatever you want to call it, video series. I've had a couple friends ask me about getting into reloading. Instead of just giving them a list of what I use and the tools that I have, I wanted to make a video or video series for them to watch so they have a better understanding for themselves of what they're getting into and maybe what tools are more important for them to spend extra money on or maybe save some money on. So what type of reloading are we going to cover? I would say it's a mix of bulk and bench rest style reloading where we're worried about being precise like bench rest but we do have to shoot a lot uh, you know two to four thousand rounds a year so the bulk aspect definitely comes into it. If you like reloading like I do and you have free time uh, I reload on a single stage press a lot of guys reload on a progressive and that works really well too. If you're interested in uh, PRS style reloading, uh, follow along. We're going to have probably two, three, four videos on uh, brass prep, loading ammo, testing, and make a whole series out of it just so that we don't have to gloss over anything. So you can revert back to it as reference later on, maybe during one step of your reloading process. So what I want to start with is fired brass. You fire your brass, say one, two, three times, depending on who you listen to. Once fired isn't enough to size this way. Uh, you know, you might need two or three firings. Uh, I've found after two firings, it works. Basically, what you're going to do is you have your dirty brass that's been once fired through your gun, through your chamber, uh, and we're going to clean it. So the first thing you need to do is throw it in some sort of media to clean it. A lot of guys will use stainless steel pins, wet tumble it, corn cob, dry tumble, they'll put it in a vibratory polisher. Uh, there's all sorts of methods to it. Uh, what I like to do is put it in a dry vibratory polisher with corn cob for about five hours. This is our RCBS vibratory case polisher. This is my preferred method. Uh, I use corn cob media with a little bit of white diamond polish, but really you could use any sort of polish that you want, any metal polish or even automotive paint polish. Um, a lot of guys do wet stainless tumbling, so they'll have stainless steel pins and they'll put them in a tumbler. It's a lot faster, but then you have to dry it and worry about if your primer pockets are completely dry, if the inside of the case is completely dry, and then also um, the stainless steel pins remove every bit of carbon. And what I've tested, learned, experienced, whatever you want to say, is that leaving that little bit of carbon in the necks as a sort of dry lube uh, helps with consistent seating pressure. Um, so what we're going to do first, take our nasty fired cases, uh, in this case they're not really that bad, and you're basically just going to dump them all in. So now they're all in, uh, you can turn it on and that will actually start to move the cases around and basically all it's going to do is rub that corn cob up against those cases for as long as you have it turned on and it's going to polish those cases. Uh, I prefer the corn cob because it gets it a really nice polish and there's zero work afterwards. So I can turn it on, set a timer for, like I said, about five hours, come back down, shake it out, and then, uh, and then it's ready to go. I don't decap the primers. A lot of guys, what they'll do is take a, all their brass through a decapping die and uh, pop all the old primers out before they do this. But what I've found is if I do do that, then the uh, primers and the flash holes inside the brass sometimes end up with media that I have to go through and clean it out. Uh, and I just don't personally care about the primer pockets being clean uh, like some people do. So now that we've let our brass clean or polish for about five hours, uh, the RCBS has come with two tops, basically one while you're doing it. Uh, and then another one that basically you just use to shake all the old media out. Um, I just shake it into a five gallon bucket. Uh, five gallon bucket fits around the rim of the 
polisher and uh, I just shake it around until I stop kind of hearing the media coming out and uh, call it good. So basically wherever it's plugged in, you just take your cord out of the side of it, get your five gallon bucket from your store of choice and uh, tip it upside down. All right, so here's your end result. Uh, you've got all of your media in your bucket and you've got your brass with mostly no media in your uh, tumbler. So what I do is just get a clear plastic, whatever Rubbermaid container. Shake all your nice shiny brass out into that and then uh, you're ready to go. One sort of optional step that I do that probably a lot of people don't do is uh, I'll take all this brass and just give it a quick wipe. Uh, with a microfiber or whatever and then put it back in the uh, reloading box uh, just to hold it just in case I'm not going to reload it right then and there. So now you've got all your brass clean. Uh, just wipe a couple. I'm probably going to do about 10 cases for this video um, just to show you and that way we can clock them. Maybe 20 so we can clock some and uh, shoot groups uh, but just so you can see, I might not get any dust that might be left over in my die or on my pad. Uh, that's another thing that I do is roll my brass on a pad with a Hornady uh, unique case lube. Uh, a lot of guys will use like a lanolin and alcohol mix. Uh, I have never tried that. They'll use a Hornady spray lube um, or Imperial sizing wax. Um, this is just what I've always done and it's uh, fast enough or good enough for me so haven't had much of a reason to change it yet. I'm going to finish wiping this brass off and then uh, we'll go through a uh, sizing die setup for your gun in your chamber um, which is basically going to be your first real step in the reloading process. Okay, so now that we've got our brass clean, sorted, separated, whatever you want to say, what we're going to do is check our 10 pieces. Uh, we're going to check it in this chamber. So uh, depending on what action you have, this is a uh, Zermatt Arms TL3. So it's a mechanical ejector, which means that the injector actually comes through the bolt head and it's actually just a pin or a claw that it's going to hit the rim of the brass. So there's no spring in here. Um, so basically to make this so that I can feel the brass in the chamber, I'm just going to pull the firing pin out of it and then uh, that's it. It's ready to go. If you have a standard spring style ejector, um, you're going to need to push the pin out of the side, take the plunger out, take the spring out, as well as take the firing pin assembly out for this method. So now that this is in the gun, drops free, nothing, uh, nothing in the chamber. Uh, you're going to take your fired brass, clean, put it in your bolt, and you can see that there's some drag on the bolt. So that means that the case somewhere is touching the chamber, whether it's the head space on the shoulder, the base, uh, it just depends on your chamber and your brass and how it grows. So you can see here still, same way, it takes some force. This one's a little bit bigger than this case. So just for this video, normally I wouldn't do this. I'm just gonna have three pieces or so that I'm gonna check when I first go to set up my dies. Same way. You can feel the resistance in the bolt handle when you're pushing it down. Uh, so what you're feeling is actually that case swelled up inside the chamber and that's rubbing the chamber walls or shoulder or something somewhere in there. And then you can also see at the top of the bolt stroke or whatever you want to call it, when it gets to here before it unlocks, it hits a stop and then it clicks open. So. That'll apply when we check the lands also. 
All right, this is one of those optional pieces that you don't have to have. They sell cheap plastic trays to hold your cases, uh, but these billet ones from Area 419 are well worth the money in my opinion. These are something I bought right off the rip because I wanted, uh, I didn't want to have an issue with my cases floating around or wiggling too much inside of here, falling over, spilling powder, doing something like that. Uh, these things have rubber feet on the bottom of the tray uh, and I don't know, I'd say they're probably a pound and a half so they don't move around on your bench. So when you put your funnel on to throw powder, nothing's falling over, tipping over. Uh, they are sized for your case. So I have 308 ones and 223 base um, just because that's the only calibers that I reload. Uh, I'm going to show you the headspace sizing method that a lot of people will use um, because they read it when they first got started or whatever. Um, it's not necessary and it's extra tools and stuff you have to buy. You also run the risk of measuring your brass in a spot where it's not rubbing your chamber. Um, and trying to move that point of the brass so that it's free. Uh, and it's an arbitrary measurement, so I think you can kind of be overworking your brass. Again, my opinion is uh, do it the way I'm gonna show you in the chamber, and you're not gonna have an issue, and you're gonna work your brass as little as you need to. Uh, a lot of guys swear by this method with reloading. Everybody's got their own way, and their way is the right way. Okay, so here are the tools for uh, one method of resizing your brass to the proper setback. Uh, so this is a Hornady Comparator Headspace Gauge Kit. Uh, comes with all your different inserts for whatever brass you're using. Um, everything is going to have what they call a datum line on the shoulder, which is, you know, depending on the reamer print, uh, the measurement is what's written on the side of these so that you know which one to use. So I don't know if you can see that. That says A330. I just got done resizing 223 brass, and so I don't have to take the barrels off of my guns and my bolt heads apart in my ARs. This is a 223 case, just for example, is you're gonna put this in here and it's gonna measure the datum line that is on the reamer print. So depending where you look, uh, we're resizing six dasher cases. Um, depending who you ask and where you look, you're gonna use a 375 or you're gonna use a 350. Uh, so what you can do, you just take your set screw loose, swap out your piece that you're not using uh, I'm gonna go with the 375 because I just looked it up and that's what somebody said is on the reamer print. So we got the 375, put it in, screw it down. Um, and then this is a set of Sterrett digital calipers. Not really necessary that you buy something this expensive. Uh, Hornady has some, everybody has some, Harbor Freight has some, Northern Tool, you can get a case, you can get a set of these for 20 bucks that are going to work good enough for what we're doing uh, for reloading. So put this on here, tighten it down, and zero your calipers out, so we're going to read zero. So uh, this is just going to drop in here, it's going to measure on that 375 line, and this is going to give us a 12485 on this case. Spin it around a couple times and that's not changing. Uh, one thing to look out for when you do this is your primer. If your primer is raised so that it sits on here and teeters on this, you're not going to get an accurate measurement with this, which is another reason uh, I don't love this method. Um, you might get an extra thou, two thou out of that lip on your primer depending on your load, your firing pin, your bolt, a lot of things. Um, these are flat. Uh, you can decap them. 
run them through a 308 die, run them through just a decapping die or whatever you want to do. Get that uh, spent primer out and that will give you an accurate measurement on this tool to see what you got. But again, that's one option. That's uh, one way people do it. Um, not how I do it. I just do it by feel in the chamber and I've always had good results. Never had any sort of issues that way. Um, but one option to consider. Okay, uh, next thing we need to do is lube our cases uh, and resize them. Somebody is about to have a brain aneurysm on how I lube my cases. Uh, this is how I've always done it. It's not the fastest way, but it's just how I have done it and uh, haven't really experimented with anything else yet. So this is a Hornady case lube kit. Uh, this thing is probably 40 bucks, maybe. Uh, comes with a pad, some neck brush, and then uh, also some lube that I don't have because it's terrible. It's super thick, gets everywhere, can't get it off your fingers, anything like that. So uh, instead of that, I got this Hornady Unique Case Lube just to try. So we'll take the lid off the pad, uh, and then how I do it, I just get a little bit on my finger here, uh, spread it on the pad, and typically this is enough to do 100 cases, which normally that's all I'm going to do is sit down and do 100 cases at a time. Uh, if I have to do more, you know, no big deal, I just re-lube the pad. Uh, but this, this gets me really good even lube on the cases. Uh, I don't have any lube that gets inside. Um, and this stuff is supposed to be thin enough, they say so that you don't get shoulder dents. Uh, I've never had the issue um, of shoulder dents. I don't know if this just because I've used this from the beginning or what, but uh, this stuff, it works good. It's not the fastest, but that's not really my uh, main concern. So just for the video, this is gonna be a little out of sync, out of order from how I normally do it. Normally I would roll the case on the pad run it through the die, uh, check it in the gun, and then wipe it off, put it back in the box, and do another one. But for this video, just for video purposes, I'm going to lube all of these, put them back in this block, and then we'll move on to sizing. So I'm actually just gonna throw them in this lid so I don't get any lube in my block for, for the future. So you can turn the case or the pad any way you want, just give it a real light roll. I just take it in my fingers, roll it like that, and call it good. Just want to get a thin layer of uh, that lube on there, a little bit on the neck, so when it goes through the die, it doesn't ruin the brass, mar it up, do whatever, get stuck. But there's our tin lubed up. We'll uh, move over to the press and the sizing die and uh, go from there. Here I've got my rifle set up with the firing pin out of the bolt. That way we can check the case in the chamber after we size it. First thing you're gonna need for sizing brass, obviously, is some sort of press. There's presses from, I don't know how cheap. Uh, as far as single stages go, I don't have a progressive. Um, I like reloading uh, and I don't really care too much about making it as fast as possible. I just want nice stuff to use to make it as enjoyable as possible. Um, so obviously for this operation you're going to need a press, you're going to need a sizing die. Depending on your caliber, who makes what, who offers what, um, you're gonna to wanna to get a full length sizing die. What the full length sizing die does is it sizes the entire case. They have neck sizing dies that size just the neck of the brass and not the body. That's something that's way more bench rest oriented, um, which those guys are even now moving to full length sizing uh, just for consistency uh, and getting rid of issues. So Forrester makes dies. I love their uh, seating dies. 
their sizing dies are fine, but they don't have a bushing uh, system for the neck. So I'm going to take my sizing die out, take it apart, and show you what that looks like. Okay, so the sizing die is going to have a lock ring on it that's probably in there tight. Craig, if you're watching this, uh, close your eyes real quick. Okay, so here's our sizing die. Uh, these lock rings are actually Forrester lock rings. Um, most of your dies are going to come with them. I've actually got a set. This is a cheap $40 RCBS 223 sizing die or reloading die set. So it's actually a cedar and sizing die. The sizing die is in the head right now. Um, but you can get dies that are cheap, 40 bucks for a whole set. If you're just sort of wanting to get into it, figure out what you want to do. Um, this is a custom Harold's die uh, for my dasher. I basically, you send them your brass uh, that's been three times fired and then they give you make a die whatever they do based off of that um, so this does not have an expander ball in it which is something that um, I'll take apart one of the other dies and show you but basically for this this is a neck bushing die so there's a bushing in here That won't come out now, uh, but there's a bushing in here. You can see that gold, and basically what that is is you select what size bushing you want to shrink the neck back down uh, to get the neck tension on the bullet that you want. So you can buy one in damn near every size. This is a 266, which works for my brass, which gives me about a thou, thou and a half worth of neck tension. Uh, I get good uniform feeling for it and uh, good consistency with velocity. Neck tension is something that guys will say is a huge deal for velocity. Um, if you're jumping the bullet, maybe. If you're jamming it, uh, I've talked to some bench rest shooters, they say that it's absolutely doesn't matter if you're jamming it because the force of the bullet jammed into the rifling is way more than whatever neck tension you're gonna have. So we'll screw that back down uh, just for this video because it's set up in the die already in the lock ring. Uh, it should come right back to my mark right there. I like to mark them so that I can tell if they moved, if they're loose, or if I do loosen some and they come out of adjustment. Um, we're just going to back it off about this much just so we can see what it does to this brass uh, when I size it and check in the chamber. Okay, so for sizing. What you're going to do generally, uh, and every press is going to have their own instructions, whatever, but basically you're going to run the ram up and you're going to screw your die in until it touches the ram. So right there, my die is touching the ram, or the shell holder on the ram, uh, and that's going to be your starting point. Or touching the ram and then back it off, say, a quarter turn. Uh, I know where mine's set up, so we're just going to back it off a quarter turn, third of a turn, and uh, start there. So basically when you go to set your die up you're gonna have your uh, lock ring and that's gonna be against your shell holder or your your turret head or your press itself and to make an adjustment you're gonna loosen this screw here and s actually screw your die in, in or out. Uh, and then you're gonna lock your screw down and that's where you're gonna set it and whatever adjustment you make from there, loosen your screw, turn your die. Tighten it down, loosen your screw, turn your die. If you need to size more, you're gonna screw it down. If you need to size less, you're gonna back it out. So just for this video, because I already have this set up, I'm going to leave the lock collar on there where it's at and just screw it down simulating what I would be doing inside the lock ring if the lock ring was tight. So we're going to back it off, say a quarter turn, half turn, uh, and then we're going to run our piece of brass through. So this piece in the chamber was tight. It's going to drop the primer out because it's got that decapping pin in there. So we're going to have no primer, uh, and it's going to have resized the neck. Not sure if you can see about down to there. 
is where that bushing has sized the neck. So I know that it's not going to be sized enough. Um, I'm going to wipe the oil off of it with a microfiber real quick. Take it over the gun, try it in the chamber, and I can still feel that it's stopping here. So I can still feel it rubbing the chamber. So we're going to go back, uh, re-lube a case, re-lube that case. We're going to give it a little more of a turn, come back up, size it again, check it. Wipe it off and check in the chamber again. So this one down a little further, a little less drag. I still can feel some right there. And that bolt handle really should just drop. So we know that we don't have it sized enough just yet. So we're gonna give it another turn. We're about a quarter turn off from my mark. Come down, size it. Wipe it off again. Check it in the chamber. Still tight. So right now it's not really doing anything but sizing the neck. It's not bumping the shoulder back enough. It's not sizing the base enough. Uh, it's not got something sized. So we're gonna tighten it a little bit more. Say an eighth of a turn there. Check that piece. So that one drops free. Uh, I like to check a couple of them on that setting just to make sure. And that one had just a little resistance on it. Do one more. So this one still has a little drag on it. So that tells me that there's either some brass inconsistency there or something with that die. So I'm just going to go a little bit more. We're going to go down to my mark since we know that's where it's at. Uh, tighten it with pliers. I doubt Craig wants you to do that, but I don't want it to come loose. Size that piece. Okay, so just to demonstrate that, the uh, bolt now that we got our sizing die set up. Uh, with nothing in the chamber, no firing pin, no ejector, drops free. No resistance, just drops all the way down. So now that we have our die set, where it should be, a couple pieces that we used at the beginning that didn't get sized all the way while we were screwing it down. I'm gonna run those back through real quick. Resize those and then uh, show you the same way. So it just drops all the way down. No issue there. So, same way. That is setting up the sizing die, how I like to do it. I like to do it the minimum you need to, just for your chamber on your fired brass. Um, I'll go back and measure those just for this video, just to show you how much it bumped it back, um, that shoulder back, where that gauge measures, um, and we'll see what kind of shoulder setback we got. I'm gonna guess that it's probably a thou, a thou and a half. Um, but regardless of what it is, we know that it fits the chamber with minimum resizing. Uh, that'll make your brass last longer and get you as close to having a fire form piece of brass in your chamber that you can. So you don't run into any excessive headspace issues and uh, work your brass the least you need to. Okay, so I know when I was doing this initially, I uh, measured with the primer in and said, you know, that one's flat. But just to make sure uh, that our measurements are good, I wanted to uh, pop the primer out. So this is a unsized case. Um, 
and I just ran it through my 308 die just enough to pop the primer out without resizing the neck or the body or anything like that. So we'll measure that, see what that comes to. That way there's no, well, you're not resizing it because your primer, blah, 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 blah. So we got one, two, four, eight, five, which is the same as what the primer was, or with the primer in it, just so, uh, you know, we can check that. And then we will uh, size this piece real quick in our die, roll it on our pad. Bump it through the die. Wipe it off real quick and we get 1.248 on this, you know, where this moved the shoulder. So it drops free in our chamber, uh, feels good, can't feel the brass at all in there, but on that gauge it says it only moved at half a thou. How much it moved it, uh, at what point it was interfering from the chamber, I don't know. Uh, but on there it says half a thou. I don't really care what the micrometer says or the caliper says uh, because we know that it's resized so that it drops free in the chamber. I guess if you want more than that, you can bump it back more. But if you change this out, like I was saying at the beginning of the video, this is the 375. If I would use the 350, maybe that measurement would be 2,000. Maybe it would be 3,000. Uh, other than going through and measuring at every one of those points with a different insert for the comparator, there's really no way to say what's getting moved back, what's touching the chamber, unless you're going to go through and maybe dye them, dye all your cases, rub them through the chamber and see where it's at, and then remeasure at that spot after you resize. But either way, I don't care. Uh, I know that it's resized enough that it fits in the chamber, uh, and there's no issue there. On a gas gun or something, maybe you'd want a little bit more setback, but on a precision bolt gun that... Uh, you know, the chamber's nice and tight. Uh, the brass, I want to fit. I don't want to rework it more than I need to. So that's the process there. That's how I do it. Uh, you're more than welcome to bump it back until this thing says 2000. Um, or, you know, change it out, bump it till another one says 2000 or 1000 or whatever you want to bump it back to. Uh, that's going to change case to case a little bit based on spring back and how it's annealed and all that jazz, but uh, that's how I like to do it. So this step here is very case dependent. What you'll have is the shoulder angle will affect how much the brass actually lengthens, uh, how much you resize it will affect how much the brass grows, and how often you actually need to trim the length of the brass. So all this is doing is trimming the neck down to take off anything that we made the grass brass grow by. Uh, 308, 223, a lot of those will grow faster. The dasher, because of the sharp shoulder angle, doesn't really grow quick, but this trimmer here uh, trims, chamfers, and deburs the neck all in one step. So I run it through every time just to do it, just so I have a nice chamfer on the inside of the neck, the outside's deburred from any, you know, if it hit the concrete, something on the sizing die, anything weird that happened, uh, that way I'm not leaving any burrs on the outside and getting stuck in my chamber. So I'm gonna turn this on, show you what it's like real quick. Um, this is an optional tool. This is one of the expensive tools that's, I think they're about 500, $550. You do need to trim your brass. Normally every couple firings you can get away with not trimming it. I like to do it every time, like I said, just for that nice chamfer. You can buy a, Lee makes one, it's a hand trimmer. Uh, Henderson has one, and it's really nice setup, but you have to hook a drill up to it uh, and use it that way. Um, but it is a nice, fast setup. This is fast, I can do 100 pieces in about eight minutes. So this takes no time at all to do especially once it's been sized or once it's been trimmed to length to what this is set up at and these come set up from Giro 
which is really nice. You might have to do a little tweaking to get it to touch your brass initially or whatever, but the cutter head itself, you order it per chamber and they basically set it up. Yeah, they even send you a example piece of brass that they cut just to show you how it was set up and how it's working. So super nice tool, uh, well worth the money. I have one for 308 and I have one for Dasher. I don't have one for 223 since I just started loading it, but depending how much I get into loading it and reloading it, I may go ahead and just order one. Uh, you can change the case holder out. Um, pretty cheap. I think it's 35 bucks or something for a, for a new case holder from them. Uh, and that just sits in here, indexes off of your head spacing, which should be all uniform based on your sizing operation. And uh, the cutters inside are set, so you would have to basically change this out, take this apart, change your cutter head, uh, which you can buy a separate one of those, or you can adjust the blades yourselves in there. So uh, we'll go through this real quick. Um, I like to do this after I mandrel, just so that the mandrel potentially doesn't ruin that chamfer. But really, I suppose you could do it in any any order. I just give them a little twist just to make sure that it gets everything. So that is it for that, and you can see, maybe, if I can get this to focus, it leaves a nice chamfer on the inside of the neck, uh, the outside is deburred, uh, and it only takes a couple seconds a piece. So now you have your nice trim chamfer deburred brass. Um, all ready to load. Now, before you get to loading, there's really one last step, uh, and it's totally optional. You can see the primer pocket inside has some crud in it. Not perfectly clean, full of carbon. Um, I generally look at them uh, just to make sure there's no big chunks, but I personally am not going to go through the time to scrape all of them. Uh, Lyman has these manual scrapers, which are nice. They work fine. They do their job. But generally, you're not going to get enough carbon buildup in there to do anything. Um, and unless you're measuring primer heights and you have something to seat them consistently enough, uh, outside of the flash hole being clogged up and big chunks or something in there. I haven't yet to really need to clean my primer pockets or seen a difference in cleaning them versus not cleaning them. Sometimes when I get new brass, I will use the tool uh, to uniform the primer pockets, which I think is what it's more used for than cleaning the carbon out. Um, and it indexes off of the case head. And then this bit obviously is just one length. So It'll scrape the pocket to a uniform depth. You can see there, it didn't scrape hardly any carbon out, a little chunk of it. Um, but again, unless you're worried about seeding primers within half a thousandth and weight sorting them and doing all that stuff, uh, which for my application does not matter. Um, I can't shoot the difference. If you're shooting Bentrest or something, maybe you want to go through that trouble, but the volume I shoot and the ability of my shooting and the positions we shoot, it, it, it's not something that you're going to see. It's something that's going to get lost in the, in the noise of everything else. So I uh, just check them before I'm priming and uh, as I'm going, you know, as I'm sizing or trimming, I'm just looking at them. Now you got your prep case. Uh, you're ready to move on to priming and loading. So, not sure if that's going to be a part two, but uh, stay tuned and check it out.